Well, please turn back with me, if you have a Bible, uh, to Genesis chapter 23. Genesis chapter 23. I think this is number 18 in our series in the life of Abraham. We're living in a society where there's not much, not much that is classed as a taboo subject anymore. There's not much that's off the agenda. There's not much that isn't somehow talked about in the media, whether in comedy or entertainment. Uh, They're constantly pushing the boundaries, aren't they, with what's acceptable and what can be talked about openly uh, and what can be broadcast. And we perhaps think, well, there's nothing left. There's nothing left that's taboo anymore. And yet when we think about it, there is this one subject that many people, they're still very, very uncomfortable uh, to talk about. Uh, This subject before us this evening, the subject of death, even in the year we've had with with daily death tolls, there is still an unease, uh, an element of discomfort when death uh, comes up uh, in a conversation. People, by and large, don't know how to handle the subject of death. And that shouldn't really surprise us as Christians. I mean, if people have no clear view of of life after death, well, we shouldn't be surprised that they're uncomfortable to to talk about it. And we're living in a society, aren't we, where, where death, it's either something to be hidden away entirely, uh, covered up, or else it's dealt with clinically, uh, professionally, mechanically. An unbelieving culture doesn't really know how to deal with death. But of course, for the people of God, that's not how it ought to be. We know a better way by the grace of God. And here in Genesis 23, we see Abraham facing the loss of his wife, Sarah. And once again, we find Abraham providing a fine example of the life of faith. Here's a man of God dealing with death. And I trust we'll see that that maybe what is at first a sad, dark chapter. I trust we'll see that in many ways it's full of lights. There's hope here in Genesis 23. I'm persuaded this is an encouraging passage in the word of God. We want to pull three things uh, out of this chapter together. Firstly, the grief. The grief. Looking really here at verses 1 and 2. As Abraham Uh, is confronted uh, with death, we see, first of all, the grief. So at the beginning, we're we're told about the death of Sarah. We don't know if there was a period of illness. Uh, We don't know if this was sudden or long and drawn out. We, We don't know the circumstances at all, other than at the age of 127, The grand age of 127, Sarah died. And it's interesting. Uh, We're given her age when she died. This is the only time in the whole of the Bible when we're given the age of a woman when she died. We have lots of cases of men and the age when they died, but only Sarah do we have her age when she died. And there's a particular honor given to Sarah, it seems. Uh, She's a special woman in the eyes of Scripture, a woman who trusted God and believed his promises. The Bible never tells us to follow the example of Mary, but it does tell us in both Old and New Testaments to note the example of Of Sarah. Isaiah 51, verse 2, we're told to look to Sarah. 
First Peter 3, verse 6, Peter, he's describing a godly woman. Once again, it's Sarah who's held up as an example to be followed. She was evidently considered a great woman. And yet the day came when it will come to us all, unless the Lord comes first, that she died. It's clear, isn't it? Her death brings enormous sadness and grief to Abraham. Verse 2. Sarah died and Abraham went in to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. He had enjoyed over 100 years with this woman. Can you imagine how their lives must have been so entwined together. And maybe thinking each other's thoughts, finishing each other's sentences. Abraham has lost his soulmate. For decades, this woman has been at his side. They've walked together this, this life of faith, and now she's gone. Now she's gone. Abraham faces his greatest agony, perhaps, perhaps his greatest test, perhaps even greater than Mount Moriah last week. He's lost his wife, Sarah, his princess. It's no surprise that he went in to mourn for her and to weep for her. The terms used there uh, they describe a substantial period of mourning, uh, something of a customary time that was set for mourning. And, and Abraham went in, we're told, to mourn and to weep. It's a very, very tender scene, very intimate, this. A husband crying over the death of his wife. Abraham grieving over the loss of his, his lifelong companion. It's the only time we're told that Abraham wept. We're not told he wept when Lot's life was on the line. We're not told he wept when he had to drive and send Ishmael away. We're not even told he wept when he was called to sacrifice Isaac. But when Sarah died, oh, he wept. He wept, and there isn't a hint in the text that he was unspiritual in this, or that he was excessive. In other words, friends, it's right and it's proper to grieve over the death of loved ones, even, even if their death is expected, even if they've lived a grand old age. It's normal and it's right. And it's appropriate even to grieve. Because you see, death is still an intruder into this world. It's, it's a reminder of how weak and frail we are. It's a reminder that, that all is not well in the world. And it brings with us this pain and sadness and loss. No matter how old Sarah was, it still pained Abraham deeply. That her earthly life had come to an end. He breaks down in tears. I'm sure nearly all of us this evening have lost loved ones ourselves. And you don't need me to tell you how the loss maybe still brings enormous pain. A sense of loss and, and mourning often still tears. Because there's something wrong, isn't there, with, with death. It's... An enemy in the world. The sting is gone, yes, for believers, but it's still an enemy. And grief is a proper response, a correct response. It's right, friends, that Abraham should grieve and mourn the death of a loved one. Faith doesn't insulate you against sorrow. Uh, trusting and believing in God, it doesn't make you immune to these things. 
Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean that you don't mourn. It doesn't mean you don't weep over loss. So let's be very clear. It's not wrong to mourn or be broken hearted. Abraham did it. And God's made us with this ability to cry. And he's given us example after example of fine men and women in scripture who did the very same. Joseph wept over the death of Jacob. The Israelites wept for 30 days at the death of Moses. David wept at the death of Absalom. Jeremiah wept over the destruction of Jerusalem. The Ephesians wept when, when Paul left them for the last time. And of course, of course, Jesus, our Lord himself, wept at the death of his good friend, Lazarus. So a proper, a right place for mourning. Sometimes, sometimes we need reminded of that. I think sometimes we as Christians, we can feel that we're letting God down somehow by grieving. As if we think, well, to be a really strong Christian, I need to get through this peacefully and it shouldn't trouble me this much. It's not, not so. There's a proper place for grief among the people of God. And in fact, bottling things up is probably more harmful than good. So the first thing this evening, that like our Lord Jesus Christ, Abraham gave expression to his grief, his sorrow, the grief. Then let's look secondly, the grave. The grave. And really this is what the most of the chapter is about. Uh, the arrangements that need to be made for Sarah's funeral. There's a problem, you see. It's a pretty major problem. Abraham does not own a patch of land in which to bury his wife. That's a problem. It's something he's only too aware of. Verses 3 and 4, he rose up. He said to the locals, the Hittites, uh, I, I, I'm an alien here. I, I'm a stranger in these parts. Uh, can you sell me some property uh, for a burying place? He, he's got no ground whatsoever. Oh yes, he's planted trees, he's, he's built wells, but he doesn't own anything of his own in this promised land. He might be rich, he might have lots of stuff, but he doesn't possess any of the land yet. We could be forgiven for maybe suggesting to Abraham, why not take Sarah back to your homeland, Abraham? Uh, maybe that would be a good way to, to honor her, uh, particularly since at the end of chapter 22, uh, Abraham has received news from the homeland from back in Haran. Maybe that would have caused him maybe to miss home a little. We, we could understand him if, if he thinks, well, we should maybe head back for a burial. But that's not what he does. And it's important that this is not what he does. He says, this is the land God has promised to me. This is the land for me and for my descendants. I need to own part of this land. So there's quite a long, drawn-out process of Abraham setting out to purchase some of the land. There's a, a deal being worked out. He goes to the city gate of Hebron. So you might remember from earlier studies, the city gate uh, was the closest thing to the town hall in those days. That was a place legal matters were worked out. Uh, Abraham asks for a burial site. It's quite a big request. Uh, remember his status here. While he's got lots of stuff, he, he's, a, he's a traveler, essentially. He, he's a foreigner. The Hittites, they reply, verse 6, with elaborate courtesy. Uh, the whole dialogue is, is marked with tremendous politeness here. It's very much the style in the Middle East. It's the way they did business. Verse 6, hear us, 
My Lord, you are a prince of God among us. Bury your dead in the choicest of our tombs. None of us will withhold you his tomb uh, to hinder you uh, in burying your dead. Sounds, sounds very, very generous. In a sense, it was. Abraham, you can borrow any of our graves. But that's not what Abraham's looking for. And, and this, this is important, friends. A borrowed grave will not do for Abraham. He needs to own. He needs to possess land of his own. So he responds by buying down. He asks to nego negotiate with one man in particular. He wants his cave, Ephron. He says, Ephron, there's a cave in, in your field. I would love to buy that field from you. Ephron turns up and he offers not just the cave, he offers the field. And again, it sounds very generous. But this is something of the custom of the day. We're, we're not to take that at face value. Even if Abraham was to take it in those terms, he still wouldn't have had legal rights to the whole land. It, he would have effectively have been a tenant uh, in the land, uh, using it rate-free perhaps. So Abraham comes back again and he's polite but, but firm. He says, oh no, sell it to me. I need, you need to sell this land. Ephron names a price. Uh, by all accounts, it's quite an extortionate price. Abraham doesn't bother negotiating. He needs to get this done. He wants a clear cut sale, no grounds for arguing. And the rest of the chapter details uh, title deeds, everything getting transferred over to Abraham. Those are the, the details. But let's not miss the wood for, for all the trees here. Let, let, let's step back a little, friends, to see this, this is a momentous event. It is momentous. Abraham, at the end of the chapter, now owns a little parcel of land in Canaan. He's a property owner in the land of of Canaan. He can now say over a patch of land, this is mine. This belongs to Abraham. So, so this purchase, purchasing of the cave, it was something vital, crucial. He's acting in faith, believing the promises of God and how this is helping him, friends, in coping and dealing with the death of Sarah. We'll think more of that in a moment, but it is worth noticing his example, isn't it? Verse 3, Abraham rose up from before his dead. The impression is he rose up and he started acting in faith. He's grieving, yes, but he rose up and he started acting in faith. These words seem to signify almost a squaring of the shoulders, a lifting of the eye, a firming of the step, the facing of responsibilities. There's a funeral, a burial to be arranged. Isn't that helpful to us? Yes, there is time for grieving, certainly. There's a point too when we rise up and we take steps of faith again. And there's a little reminder too that, that the funeral service, a Christian burial, those are essential parts, aren't they, of, of the grieving process for family, for loved ones. Surely for many of us, that's been one of the most difficult restrictions over the last year, uh, funeral, burial restrictions. And it's an important distinction to make, isn't it? Funerals, they're actually more for the living than they are for the dead. Uh, they're for the living funerals. That's worth thinking about. They're designed to help the grieving process. This is the very first burial recorded in the Bible. That of Sarah in verse 19. After this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave 
of the field of Machpelah. The first burial. This, it's not a major point in the passage by any means, but it does raise the issue for us, doesn't it, of, of what we do with the body after death, friends, of what we do with our body after death. I don't think this is the time or place to go into at great length the merits of burial versus cremation. I want to be extremely sensitive in what I say, but I'm also aware that very, very little is sometimes said from the pulpit about it. Uh, let me be clear, nowhere does the Bible, nowhere does the Bible forbid cremation. And certainly it will not hinder in the slightest the Lord's ability to resurrect the human body. Not in the slightest. But it seems to me that the Bible is not indifferent towards the subject either. What do the scriptures say? Consistently, we find in the Bible that burial is the practice held out for us. Uh, and even when the nations around them might have burned their loved ones, the example of God's people in Scripture was always, always to bury their loved ones and to view the body, even after death, with great care, great love, great honor, great dignity. Now, I realize I'm new into this congregation and I don't know everyone's stories and I don't know what everyone has been through and I please, I want to be sensitive, but it seems to me that the Bible presents a strong case in favor of, of burial over cremation. Not least here, in the very first record, Abraham went to great pains to secure a grave, a, a, a tomb, a burial site for his dearly loved wife. The grave, the grief the grave. But then thirdly, the guarantee. The guarantee. Abraham grieved, but he didn't grieve as those who had no hope. For Abraham, this grave pointed towards something. This grave, it reminded him of something. It spoke to him of of a promise God had made. This grave, it, it communicated a thousand things to Abraham. It spoke of a promised dwelling place. This grave, it was a guarantee for Abraham. A visible demonstration that he had now gained a foothold in the land of Canaan. It was a sure and certain reminder of, of a dwelling place. God had provided for him. And surely that's an important thing for us to note. Seeing Abraham's faith in God's promise as he dealt with Sarah's death. This was the only piece of land Abraham ever owned in Canaan. And in doing so, he's saying, this is, this is but the, the first fruits and I believe God will do as he has promised. And how helpful this must have been for, for the first readers of Genesis, the Israelites, uh, as they were about to enter the promised land for themselves, and they've been told of this promised land. What an encouragement for them to hear, to read this account of, of their great forefather Abraham. And God has already begun to make his promises come true. And because of this grave, the promised land is secure. Because of this grave, victory is certain. And friends, is that not so helpful for us? Yes, it is appropriate to mourn. It is okay to grieve, but we don't grieve as those with no hope. Because of a grave, another grave, another death. 
because of another body laid in another cave. We have, we have hope, friends. We, we have a guarantee, the promised land. It, it's a certain, a sure and certain for you and for me. Think of Jesus. Jesus Christ, the promised offspring of Abraham. How he went to our place of death uh, as, as our substitute, laid in a cave. This time it was borrowed, wasn't it? It was borrowed, not purchased. Borrowed because it wouldn't be needed long. It wouldn't be needed long. On the third day, he rose again. The first fruits of all those who believe. That, friends, that is our guarantee today. Not even death. Not even the grave could hold back Jesus. And he rose again, defeating death, defeating Satan, defeating the grave. By his death, he has overcome death. Now, John Owen puts it very helpfully. He speaks of the death of deaths in the death of Christ. That's great, isn't it? The death of deaths in the death of Christ. The guarantee. Because of his death, our death is but the door through which those who trust in Christ enter into everlasting life. So the point of this chapter is surely Abraham securing this burial plot, showing his, his faith in God's promise that he would give this land to his descendants. And not only Sarah, but Abraham himself would be buried in this cave. Isaac, Rebekah, Leah, and Jacob, they would all be placed in this cave as a testimony of their faith in God's promise. The writer to the Hebrews says as much, they desired a better country, that is a heavenly one. Hebrews 11, Abraham was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose building, the designer and builder is God. His faith looked beyond this grave. It looked beyond the grave to the promises of God the Savior. That's how believers face death. Looking beyond the grave to the promises of God in Jesus Christ the Savior. They say, God, you have promised me. You have promised me something I haven't yet fully realized. You've promised me more than this life. You've promised eternal life with you. You've promised a new resurrection body. You've promised a day when all tears and all pain and all sorrow will be wiped away. And in this moment of despair, when death has claimed my loved one or, or when death stares me in the face, I trust in your promises. Your promises are my hope in the face of death. Yes, we grieve. We grieve at the death of loved ones. And sometimes the grief is very sore indeed. But not as those with no hope. Because we have a saviour who has defeated death. And has gone ahead of us to prepare a place. That's the only way. We can deal with death, friends. Being found trusting, believing in the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Having your sins forgiven because of the cross of, of Jesus Christ. The believer, this evening, you can face death with courage because Jesus has already faced death. And one but if you have not yet come to Jesus Christ, I ask you, I ask you, how on earth are you going to deal with death? 
Or more to the point, how is death going to deal with you? Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he dies, yet shall he live. Everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Amen.